matter. On my part, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the party, the, the National Resistance Movement Party in its thinking, in its philosophy, <coughs> wouldn't want to constrict itself into a thinking that makes everybody feel like they are, we are not giving them a chance. We, as a party in government, we contested for leadership. Our manifesto was voted for, and just like another party that came to contest. And uh, we are in leadership because of the popular vote by the people. And it is in our interest that we have opposition which is organized enough to challenge our activities of governance. In a way, we think that it's better to deal with an organized opposition. It's better to deal with an opposition that think through what it's supposed to oppose. And so critical thinking under multi-party political dispensation, we know there are many other political parties that equally so have members represented in parliament. And therefore we feel all of them should participate in the governance process of this country. Now having said that, we also know that uh, the constitution is very constraining, that parties contest for governance and a winning party is voted for based on its manifesto and the first runner-up becomes a leader of opposition. That has been the practice. And with the, with the administration of parliament, a leader of opposition is picked from the party that comes second in the national election. Now, we've been debating and seeing to what extent would such represent the interests of all other political parties in parliament which are in opposition? And have we been able to get their views in many of these critical national issues when a leader of opposition speaks in parliament? Does he or she speak on behalf of other political parties who are in opposition? Or he or she speaks on behalf of his party that sponsors him to become a leader of opposition? Now, having looked at these two scenarios, I would therefore request that I invite the director league of the party to take us through what the party feels could be the most appropriate way through in this. Thank you. Thank you. And as I also invite you to an, uh, a large hour snack with a cup of copies. Mr. Chairman, I was out of town and I came back last evening. I'm just in the process of polishing up the ideas and putting them together. I think before close of day or by me, by before midday tomorrow, we shall send an official written document to the committee. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, honourable members of the committee, for inviting us. Uh, indeed, I reiterate uh, the appreciation expressed by the Secretary General for us being here. We 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 have looked at the at the. Uh, bill, the Administration of Parliament Amendment Bill 2024. We have looked at the objects of the bill and we, we will comment on them as the matters on which they are, uh, they are, they are, uh, they comment arise. We have also noted that there are some additional proposals in the bill which do not seem to be captured. Uh, by the object of the bill, um, they, they appear to have been proposed by the mover of the bill subsequently. Nonetheless, as that is a matter entirely of procedure, we shall still address them and uh, we leave the rest of it uh, to, to the committee and to parliament. So on clause one of the bill, clause one of the bill proposes to change the definition of the leader of the opposition. The current act is that the, uh, the current law is that the leader of the opposition is that person who is elected by the uh, party in parliament with the highest numerical strength. Um, I think that is section 11. I, I must have misplaced my act somewhere. Now, we believe that to cast the leader of the opposition as such 
would go against the established traditional parliamentary systems in most of the Commonwealth jurisdictions. The leader of the opposition is typically a leader chosen by the largest political party not in government. And that position typically exists in multi-party democracies. Now, in fact, in other jurisdictions where it is completely a parliamentary democracy, the leader of the opposition naturally is the leader of the other party that has come second. But in our case, because we have some sort of hybrid the leader of the opposition is not necessarily the leader of that party, but is elected or selected by that party that has come second. But I think for want of better language, we the, the, the law talks about the biggest numerical strength in parliament because the leader of opposition is elected in parliament. So that office is established by Article 81A of the Constitution, so it's a constitutional office. And we hold the view that the current uh, definition aligns well with multi-party democracy. We do not think there is anything wrong with it, and we shall explain that um, later. Uh, clause 2 is the one that proposes to have members of all the political parties in opposition in parliament, elect a leader of the opposition. Now, uh, if we go back a little bit to the definition, the, the definition is assuming that the leader of the opposition is supposed to serve that party which he leads, which is not correct. The leader of the opposition is an office, it is established, it is there regardless of which party is in power or of which party comes second. So, But the office itself is established as a leader of the opposition with specific functions that are not delineated or are not uh, limited to achieving the objectives of that political party. So we maintain that this runs uh, contrary to multi-party democracy and negates the popular vote. When you look at the spirit of the law, the spirit of the law is that in a multi-party democracy, the party that achieves the biggest number of the popular vote forms government. It is that same spirit that says the other party that next achieves the next highest popular vote selects the leader of the opposition. So there is a popular vote to it. And you cannot purport to uh, take that away. And so we think that uh, an attempt to then subject that leader of opposition to the other uh, uh, political parties in the House would effectively be stripping the other political party of its right and power in some sense. Um, so that is our position on that. We are inclined to suggest and propose that the law remain as is on that point. Clause 3, I, 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 I have run, I will run through this uh, fairly quickly because I assume Everybody here has, 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 of course, had the benefit of the bill. Uh, this clause seeks to add, that's clause three, seeks to add a gr grounds upon which a leader of opposition can be removed. Now, all these things are a bit connected. If you look at clause one, making the definition, <coughs> you look at clause two, seeking to make the amendment, then you will find that there are several other things that lead to that. So once, um, uh, once for example, the idea that the leader of opposition is elected 
uh, by other members of parliament, uh, by the other political parties, once that collapses, you will find that several other things linked to it would necessarily uh, not make sense. Um, so, following a submission on clause 2 and 1 that we have just made, we find that clause 3A and 3B are untenable. Um, those clauses, I can read them for, for, for us to just be sure. Clause 3A is about the leader of the position to be elected. And then clause 3B is the one that talks about a nomination of three persons from amongst whom the election, the one one will be elected. So naturally, those would collapse for the same reasons <coughs> that we have given. Clause three C provides for removal of the leader of opposition on account of inability to perform his functions. Uh, sorry, I think I read the wrong one. Uh, clause three A was. Uh, it, these are about how to remove uh, additional grounds for removal of leader of opposition. So, one is ceasing to be a member of the political party in opposition to the government, having the greatest numerical strength. That is already covered by the law, which says if he ceases to be a member of that political party which elected him, so we, that, that is automatic. So, th this is only proposed because it is based on changing the system. The second one is that he or she is removed from office of leader of opposition by a resolution of the members of the opposition parties in the parliament. Now, again, you can see here that the party now has lost its authority over its members uh, uh, and cannot discipline. And, and we, we, we think that for a multi-party democracy, the parties should be empowered, they should be strong, they should be allowed to grow. If you strip them, you keep stripping them, then uh, we, we, we have a challenge. And, and since I, I have heard here that uh, the, the, the proposal is to be effectuated at a future date, you never know uh, who, who it will be. Um, so we support the one that says he or she is unable to perform the functions of his or her office due infirmity of body or mind. That is natural and uh, that is a proposition that we support that can be added. There are two other propositions that are made in clause uh, uh, D, 3D and uh, 3C that he, can be rem he or she can be removed for, for being incompetent or for misbehavior. We find those problematic because they are too broad. They are too broad and uh, in their present state, they require now also some natural justice. How are you going to determine the incompetence? What if it is challenged? If it is challenged, it goes to court. In the meantime, we are stuck in parliament and uh, what is happening? So we find those two grounds uh, are too broad um, we do not see so far that they are curing a particular mischief outside the provisions that are already provided for. Uh, so, clause four uh, is the one that seeks to introduce the requirement that the shadow cabinet appointed by the leader of the position under section. 11.2 of, of the current Act, CAP 272, be subject to approval of the members of the opposition parties in Parliament. Now, the current law talks about consultation that you can consult. We do not find that problematic. We do not find that there is a mischief to be cured. Uh, and given our views on the nomination or election of the leader of opposition, uh, we think that that one also uh, perhaps should not uh, uh, pass. 
We support the proposal in clause 4C in as far as it provides for discretionary consultation and does not seek to take away the rights and powers of the party with the highest numerical strength in the parliament. So clause 4C um, is the one that says that the leader of the opposition shall be required in consul the leader of the opposition in consultation with opposition political parties represented in the parliament, appoint chairpersons and deputy chairpersons of standing committees which are required to be chaired or deputized by members from the opposition. Um, this will ensure that the views of the political parties are considered while appointing chairpersons and deputy chairpersons of the op opposition committees. Uh, we do not find a problem with that proposal. We would support uh, clause 4C. Now, those were the main, I think, proposals in the bill, and then there were the additional proposals. One was on the election of the commissioners, and the proposal is that Section 2 of the Principal Act be amended to provide that the two commissioners who are backbenchers, that, that, that term is introduced, should be elected and they should not belong to the same party. But the provisions of the act as it is now are based on, again, the recognition of multi-party democracy. All these offices are based, because they are talking about numerical strength, numerical strength. That is our democracy. That is how it runs. So um, the underlying assumption is that the ruling party and that the party with the largest numbers not in the government would generally represent the majority of, of Ugandans, one the alternative of the other. So we propose that the amendment uh, uh, would take away that crit critical factor and would think that there is no uh, problem with that provision staying as it is. The other additional proposal was on budgeting for the LOP office. Again, we go back to the fact that this is an office and the budgeting is done for the office. The budgeting is not done for the party or for the individual that is in the office. It is for the office. We take the view that um, it would it would it would, it would not serve the purpose if you now spread that budget among political parties. You are you are not funding. It would uh, assume that you have split the functions of that office among those political parties along some other line. That, that, that we are not quite clear about. But also, as you know, the political parties already get um, uh, funding based on their numerical strength. So this would run counter to that and would not, uh, uh, again, think that uh, it serves the purpose which it is thought uh, to be serving. And if, if that purpose itself, I think, is contrary to the office. So then there was a hypothetical pre presented. There is a, a, a provision, an additional proposal that is based on a hypothetical situation where a political party in the opposition, two political parties in the opposition have the same number of MPs in parliament. Now it, it is hard to deal with the hypothesis uh, but our view would be that it is unlikely it, it, it is unlikely that you would have the second uh, party in a general election you would have a tie in the votes in the general election and have a tie in the members of parliament our view would be that the better way to solve that hypothetical situation would be to deal with the uh, party that comes second in the general election uh, but that is still a hypothetical, and I, I say this with a lot of uh, reservations because it is a hypothetical, it's a bit complicated to, to, to deal with. Um, the final proposition uh, in the additional proposals was the election again of the chief whip. Um, I think this follows the same 
uh, position that we have discussed regarding these elections. Um, uh, I think the chief whip is, is uh, uh, also follows the same process of, 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 of election. Incidentally, the, laws, the law does not say that these people must be, uh, that, for example, the chief whip should be elected from the party with the, should be an MP belonging to the party with the major, uh, highest numerical advantage. It doesn't say that, but the appointment would come from that party. So, uh, honorable chairperson and members, that is a, a, a high-level summary of our views on the bill. As my Secretary General has said, we shall be pleased to submit uh, a formal written uh, view on the matter. Mr. Chairman, if you may, I can maybe invite my colleagues who are here with us to, if they have anything else to add on the, the presentation by the Director Ligo. But the short and long of it is the NRM, regardless of how opposition present themselves, whether in groups or individually, we just want a credible people. To say something for emphasis, uh, why we agreed with the position the Director Legal stated was that uh, when you look at Clause 1, where it says the amendment seeks to ensure that the leader of opposition represents the views and aspiration of all political parties. The question was, are the views the same? Because every party came there with their views. So at this moment, to purport to box them into one corner and have one view may be a little difficult. Because you're saying he's going to represent the views and the aspirations. Everybody came with different views. The other thing was uh, uh, to Article 82 uh, of the Constitution gives really discretion to Parliament to do this. But we thought that, and we have always seen that Parliament will exercise that discretion judiciously. And this is where we came out clear in this position because our party chairman has always said that what NRM says during the day is what it says during the night. And therefore we expected that this discretion, Parliament would use its discretion very judiciously, not with suspicion. And that is why we are honest to, to this position that Director Legal has said. The other comment I wanted to say was, on the funding, the director made it clear that uh, under another legal regime where the money goes to electoral commission, money is given to parties in numerical strength. And therefore, if there was any feeling of parties getting that money, it is being catered for under that legal regime. And therefore, the money which is meant for an office X, in our opinion, it would be wrong to divide the off money meant for office X to other parties. I thought we wanted to say that. Uh, uh, and you see, even when you talk to go to the draft, the text as it is, uh, I think because of that wanting mind, the drafting was like to budget and allocate to the parties in opposition to government in parliament in accordance to their you see that jumping in the drafting to allocate what to allocate and it consistently in the draft to to allocate to allocate meaning that in a kind of hasty mind the drafts lady or drafts man also was not confident because in other words was supposed to draft that to allocate money for opposition leader of opposition but it didn't want to commit that to, to, to allocate money for leader of opposition so that hasty mind led to that kind of drafting so 
Uh, I just wanted to say this, if it is for matters of emphasis or clarity, but the position is what the Director Ligua has stated. I thank you. The director Rico has said it all. When you look at the bill, there is nothing it wants to cure. Have we failed to, to do the work? Have we failed to conduct our business in parliament? Has the opposition failed to conduct business because there is, they have not elected the people, the, the, the opposition together? No? So for us, we, as, member, as uh, NRM, we say it is. We, we remain with the status quo. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, we are done with our